I live in Tisbury and I'm on the board of the Vineyard Conservation Society. And there's some other board members and staff here as well this evening. Um, we're really grateful to Tristan for putting this together and to all of you for giving us your time this evening. What we want to do is show you a presentation that we've put together about sea level rise. We did it to help people understand what some of the impacts here on the vineyard would be. There's a lot of information out there, a lot of it's confusing, and so we decided to focus on something tangible and real to just help people see what might be in the cards. Our plan is to share this with other groups and organizations and use it at events and things like that. But we've brought it to you first, and that's partly because in thinking about this, we came to the conclusion that no one town or agency or organization can deal with this by themselves. Uh, we're all going to have to work together. Also because the lead times for whatever people decide to do to deal with this are going to be very long, and so we need to get going. We need to start a conversation about this. Because it could happen within the lifetimes of kindergartners who are living on the vineyard today. That's the kind of time frame we're talking about. Look at the next little kid you see on a playground. Um, so we call it rising seas. Um, and um, the presentation includes a bunch of maps, which you have copies of. Um, they're based on a variety of scientific forecasts. Um, they're the same forecasts that are used in the state's climate change adaptation report that came out a year ago, also being used by the Martha's Vineyard Commission. And you're going to see two colors on the maps, yellow and red. The yellow shows the areas that would be inundated if we get three feet of sea level rise, which the forecasts all say is going to happen somewhere between 2050 and 2070, not that far away. Then there are also red areas on the maps, and that's the next increment, the next uh, three feet of sea level rise, which the forecasts say is between the end of the century and maybe 20 years after that. Um, what the maps don't show is any additional flooding that would result from high tides or storm surges or anything like that. What the maps show is just where the water is going to be on a nice July afternoon. I should point out that VCS didn't do these forecasts. Um, they've been done by the United Nations climate people uh, and a whole variety of scientific studies sort of one a year ever since that. Um, and what we actually see out there, of course, maybe less or maybe more than the forecast. I'd be surprised if it's right on the money. Um, so we've shown the top end of the forecasts, kind of the worst case of today's forecasts. Um, but we need to keep in mind that the, the forecasts keep getting worse as time goes on somehow. Um, in real terms, the annual rise in the water level here in the northeast, right here at the vineyard, has been about a foot in the last 100 years, 11 inches. Um, and that's based on measurements in Woods Hole and Nantucket. But the rate's accelerating, and many people believe that in the second half of the century, the rate could be three times what it is now. Um, so you can't really go by what we see out there today, even though it's noticeable. So here's the first one of these maps, and you can see the yellow, which is the first three feet of sea level rise, and the red, which is the second three feet of sea level rise. This, of course, is Vineyard Haven. Downtown is right in here. This is uh, Beach Road that goes over. This is where the bridge is. Um, Hines Point's down here. State Road goes down here. Five Corners is right about in here. And as you can see, both sides of Beach Road um, 
appear to get inundated very early on from the drawbridge all the way back to Five Corners. Um, also the commercial and industrial district between Beach Road and Lagoon Pond Road down in there. Um, and in downtown, what the forecasts say, uh, this is Main Street right here, and that the water could come up roughly halfway to Main Street. Um, this is the steamship terminal right here, this little red spot, and their uh, pier right there. But also in this area, there are numerous businesses, municipal parking lots, a lot of municipal infrastructure. Um, it's serious stuff. Um, the post office is right here, and this is Veterans Memorial Park, which would get inundated in the latter phases. And interestingly, you can still find here on the island photographs and old postcards that show people rowing and sailing right where Veterans Park is now because it used to be part of the harbor and was filled in. So if we move to the east, here's um, the lagoon and the harbor and the bridge right here um, <clears throat> into Oak Bluffs. Um, and the, the Oak Bluffs shore on Vineyard Haven Harbor, as you probably know, is very low-lying land. It's, it's beaches and dunes and ponds all along here up to Crystal Lake and then a bit beyond. And that area, especially in the, the second meter of water rise, um, gets severely hit. Um, also down here, Brush Pond is behind the hospital. This is the hospital right here. And there are wetlands all around it that come all the way up here to Eastville Ave and County Road. Um, and so the first meter of sea level rise fills this area and basically almost surrounds the hospital. And the impacts on the road access include Beach Road, uh, East Chop Drive, which is already getting beat up by storms, um, and Eastville Ave, and possibly County Road. Um, it's not a good situation there. Moving on into uh, the center of Oak Bluffs, uh, here's Circuit Avenue. Um, here's the campground, um, School Street out to Town Hall and the library. Um, and as you can see, especially with the second meter of rise, the water would cross East Chop Drive. There are numerous houses along here that would be affected. Down here in this triangle is where there are a number of uh, harbor-related businesses right at the foot of uh, Circuit Avenue Extension um, that would be impacted. And currently there are wetlands and very low areas in here, so the water would move right down through there, um, including into the edges of the campground um, on two sides. <clears throat> And moving along, um, this is Seaview Avenue headed down to Edgartown uh, Farm Pond. And as I'm sure you know, the land around Farm Pond is very low, marshy, flat. Um, and that will allow the waters to expand up into the residential neighborhoods up in here and into most of Wabin Park which surprised me. I always thought Wabin Park was a lot higher than Farm Pond, but it's not. Um, the water would also extend out to the end of Farm Pond Preserve, uh, not to the Oak Bluff School, but headed that general direction. It would also move a bit into Hart Haven. And on the Seaview Avenue is obviously um, cause for concern. And the flooding on the seaward side could extend all the way down to Hearts Harbor and Ice House Pond down there.
Edgartown obviously has a tremendous amount of frontage on a variety of bodies of water um, and a lot of ponds within that frontage. And it looks like from the forecasts, um, basically the new shoreline of the sound is going to be the landward side of all those ponds. Here's Senjakantakit Pond up here, Upper Traps and Lower Traps Pond in here. Um, you've got Eel Pond, Sheriff's Pond, um, all moving inland. Uh, fortunately, there are not a lot of houses in these areas. There are a lot of wetlands and marshes, but not all that many houses. But it's going to be a dramatic transformation of this coastline. And in the downtown area, from Starbuck Neck out here down um, past Cook Street, which is right about here, the whole downtown waterfront appears to be impacted back almost to north and south Water Street. Um, and that includes the on-time ferry terminal, a whole variety of infrastructure and important businesses and substantial homes in this, in this area. Um, as you can see, Chappie Point also is involved. And we can look at that a little more. <clears throat> um, both terminals of the ferry are there, and Caleb's Pond appears to connect to the harbor so that this becomes an island out here. So what that means for the ferry, I don't know, but it's going to be a long old ride. Uh, otherwise, all of these bodies of water, Katama Bay, Pocha Pond, Cape Pogue Bay, uh, and the harbor all begin to move inland. Um, and we know Chappie can change quickly and often, um, so that's not terribly surprising. What we don't know is what this will mean for the barrier beaches that provide some protection to all of this. Normally, beaches replenish and move and maintain themselves. Um, but the forecasts also include larger and more frequent ocean storms. So hopefully there will be time between the storms for these barrier beaches to heal themselves. They may get relocated and rearranged, but hopefully they will stay there. But I'm not a professional in this, so I can't really answer that. Um, still in Edgartown, but down at Katama. Um, this is... Katama Farm, Katama Road that comes down to the left fork, Atlantic Drive that goes over and connects to the right fork, and Edgartown Bay Road that comes around here. This whole area is very flat, uh, very low-lying land, and there are more than 100 homes in this area. Um, and interestingly, what if the forecasts are right, what could happen is in the first three feet, um, this area could be isolated by flooding down through here, um, which, which will certainly impact all of these houses as well. And moving west uh, to West Tisbury and Chilmark and the Great Ponds, Chilmark Pond, Black Point Pond, Tisbury Pond, you can see that what happens is that they basically migrate inland, not terribly far, um, but in a lot of places. Um, and there is good agricultural land in this area. There are homes in this area. Um, and it's another cause for concern. Up here is uh, West Hisbury Center, and South Road runs right down there. Um, so this will have impact on our fisheries, uh, because these are uh, incubators for all kinds of uh, fish and shellfish. Then moving uh, out to Chilmark and Aquina, uh, this is the entrance to this is Menemsha Harbor and the entrance to Menemsha Pond. 
Uh, fortunately, most of the houses on the Chilmark side are up on the hills. They're up above uh, the water. And this area is currently a wetland now, so there are not houses in there. But there's a lot of infrastructure right along here. The, the docks, the bulkheads, the roadways, the utilities that could be inundated. Um, and even if it's not inundated, when the water gets right up to the surface, any storm is going to cause a lot of damage there. Um, on the other side of the harbor, we've got the Cranberry Lands and West Basin Road, all the way up to Lobsterville Road and beyond. Um, and this area, which is environmentally very fragile and significant, uh, basically is really impacted. And even though this shows some of these dunes surviving, I doubt that they will. Uh, with, with that much water around them. But in any case, when this opens up and becomes water through here, it means Menemsha Pond is directly exposed to storms from the north and the northwest, which will be a complete change from the situation now. So, um, having looked at all this and thought about it for quite a while, we call these takeaway messages. They're actually just things that we need to think about. One is that sometime soon after the end of the century, the impacts could be severe and comprehensive and island-wide. Um, impacts on our infrastructure, we've seen what some of those could be. And everybody I talk to mentions the public infrastructure, the roads, the ferry terminals, the docks and harbors and those things. Uh, but there's also our private infrastructure, our power infrastructure and communications, and our freight and fuel docks, and those kinds of things. They're all private. There may well be impacts to public revenues and public costs that would be unprecedented, um, including lost revenue from direct public enterprises like harbors and docks, um, lost property tax revenue from properties that are destroyed or nearly destroyed. Um, it's possible that property tax valuations would decrease based on either a perceived or real threat to the property. Um, I know realtors are concerned about property values already. And there almost certainly will be increased costs for public safety and infrastructure, uh, for insurance, which will be a biggie, I would guess, and for services, design, engineering, and legal kinds of things. There may be broader economic impacts. Um, uh, for instance, reduced tourism. Um, I don't know what the tourism business is going to be like on the Jersey Shore this summer after the hurricane went through there, but it probably isn't going to be like old times down there. Um, there could be reduced employment in the, the food and lodging and second home sectors. Um, there certainly will be impacts to fishing and shell fishing and boating sectors of the economy. And the last takeaway, as I said at the very beginning, it seems to us that no single town or agency can go it alone here. I mean, we not only share ownership of the ponds and waterways, but also infrastructure and all the rest. And it just isn't possible for one town to put together a plan without working with the other towns. Um, it seems to us that prevention is just simply impossible. It would cost billions and billions of dollars to prevent this on the island. And with a population of 15 or 20,000, the feds aren't <coughs> going to send us truckloads and boatloads of money. Uh, even mitigation could cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So it seems to us like cooperation and planning are pretty cheap by comparison and certainly not a bad way to get started. Um, so this is just a summary. The, the maps were prepared by the commission. Chris Seidel made them for us. 
And as I said at the beginning, they only show sea level rise. You can add on to this uh, high tides and storm surges. And the problem I mentioned that they're based on today's topography, they don't recognize the fact that a sand dune may wash away or a road may disappear or things like that that otherwise would stop uh, water from coming inland. So anytime you want a preview, come on over to Tisbury and we'll take you down to five corners after a storm. <laughs> and I think anybody who reads the papers uh, is seeing the, the power of nature and the power of water. Um, in real time these days. So um, I'm out of time now and we all want to hear Steve McKenna. Um, we'd be happy to do this in, in your towns if you'd like to get your fellow selectmen or planners or conservation people together, we'd be happy to do that. Um, you've got the um, handout and um, thank you. <laughs>